You know, you all probably think that when the speaker gets up here and stands quietly for a moment or two that he's nervous. It ain't that. He's trying to decide whether he's got to go back to the toilet or not. <clears throat> Every time that I get in front of a bunch of AAs, I think about that old story about this old dude that survived that Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania back in the 19th century. And after it was over, he regaled everybody that he met with the story of how he survived the Johnstown flood and he finally died. He went to heaven and St. Peter took him into his room and there's a bunch of people sitting there. And he said, you reckon I ought to tell them about how I survived the Johnstown flood? And he said, yeah, you can, but Noah's sitting in the front row. You know, back in February when they called us, it was an answer to our, one of our great desires and prayers, because for years we wanted to come to Vancouver. We've, hell, we've talked about it to everybody from Canada. <clears throat> and we really planned on it. But a few weeks ago, uh, I began to have a little problem with my uh, eating. I couldn't eat. So finally, I went to the doctor. That's always the last resort, you know. <laughs> I used Alka-Seltzer and Tums and everything else, and none of them worked. So anyhow, they tested and retested and looked and checked and ran everything. And finally, last Wednesday, the doctor says, you got a cancer and we got to operate right away. I said, that's your paper ash talking. I'm going to Vancouver. And, <clears throat> so next week sometime I want y'all to say a prayer but not for me for that damn doctor because I want him to do right <clears throat> I'm Cherry Carpenter I'm an alcoholic hi there everybody by the grace of God and the help of alcoholics and Anonymous and the love and tolerance of a lot of people like you I've had another 24 hours of drink away from a drunk and that's my whole story but they've re, uh, requested that I don't take over two hours to tell it. My name really is Cherry. It's not a nickname, and it's a, it caused a lot of consternation amongst people who hear it and read it and so forth on the program because they're expecting some big brassy ass blonde to come up here. You know. <laughs> But it ain't all bad. Because old Violet's the only woman been married 44 years and still got her cherry. <laughs> I want to tell you some things before I start talking. I don't know why I became an alcoholic. Now, there's no psychological reason for it whatsoever. I have looked for it, and I've listened for it, and everybody else has talked, and they've come up with some beauties, you know, about their mama and daddy and their cousins and brothers and how they were treated and mistreated, and I couldn't find a damn thing. I just liked to drink. And I drank everything that was too thin to chew. And I drank on two occasions, when I was by myself or with somebody. <laughs> and I only drank beverage alcohol. I never got involved with all the sophisticated drugs. I don't know why I didn't, not for any moral reasons or anything else. I just didn't. I guess because alcohol gave me everything that I wanted. And I never went to a treatment center because we didn't have no damn treatment centers. And if we had, I couldn't have afforded it because insurance didn't pay for it in those days. And I didn't have insurance anyhow. <laughs> oh, I did go to a couple of treatment centers. I'll take it back. I went to the city jail and the county jail numerous times, <laughs> but they never worked. I haven't had a drink since the night I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm living proof that a slip is not necessary. They happen, but they don't ever let anybody tell you that you've got to have one to be a part of this program. I remember 
I would hear people get up and talk, and they'd say, I had 11 months, and then I had my slip. I had nine months, and then I had my slip. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, when am I supposed to have my slip? And after he got through cussing me, I never asked again about his slip. <laughs> I'm 68 years old. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous on April the 7th, 1960, and that was it for me. Because I found something here that I'd been looking for in every damn drink and every damn bottle that I ever had to my lips for the previous 28, 30 years of drinking. And it's still that way. And when I came in, there was one group in Nashville. It met on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. That was the, all of the in Nashville. So they couldn't tell you then to make 90 meetings in 90 days. And naturally, I asked, how long do I have to make these damn meetings? And uh, my sponsor says, well, you just make them keep coming until you want to. And I did, and I've never stopped wanting to since then. I've never made less than four meetings a week. Well, we started the fourth one very shortly after I came into the program. I've never made less than four meetings a week. And right now, I make from five to seven meetings every week. And that's not a damn bit too much. Because they told me in the beginning, they said, you've got an incurable, progressive, fatal disease. Well, if it's incurable, I'm always going to have it. And if it's progressive, it damn sure ain't no better today than it was then. And if it's fatal, my ace is gone if I don't keep coming. So I can't ever think of a reason not to come. And I can think of a whole lot to come. Mainly because I love all of you, because you're the kind of people I always liked from the time I was a little kid. I had an affinity for drunks, and I do today, and that's what you are, and that's why I like you. <laughs> this is the only program in the world where you've got to be a rotten son of a bitch to qualify. This is the only place in the world where you see people get up and try to outdo each other in proving how much worse they were than the last guy. <laughs> and I love it. It's given us everything in life that human beings could ask for, and I'm not talking about the material things. I'm talking about the real things that uh, we finally learn of what count in life. I didn't get in any trouble from drinking until I, oh, I guess I was nearly 16. Because <laughs> I started drinking. I don't know when I started drinking because it was during that wonderful experiment in the United States of Prohibition, you know. And everybody could not buy whiskey, but they could make it in their home. They were allowed to make a certain amount. And of course, everybody stayed within the limits, you know that. And, <laughs> So uh, everybody had it. My daddy made home brew and uh, wine and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, every two-fisted kid that was anything to him, he would steal it. And I did. And so I don't remember starting drinking, but I remember the first recollection I have of drinking was that I loved what it did. I never liked the taste of it, but I loved what it did. I loved how I felt. I loved how brilliant I became. See, I was short, fat, ugly, dumb, and poor. But when I took that drink, I was tall, handsome, smart, rich, and everything that a man should be. And it stayed that way for many years, up until the last few years of my drinking. But I got in this trouble, and I, when I did get in trouble, it started out a misunderstanding between me and the law enforcement agencies. Now, that first time, it was for lording about a disorderly house, and those girls were just as nice as people could be in that place. <laughs> but I didn't have any problem with drinking. I never had a problem with drinking. I had a problem with people. People never understood, and so that misunderstanding between me and people drove me into the service. I was patriotic anyhow, and uh, the draft was imminent, and I knew I'd get it pretty quick. So at uh, 1940, I joined the service, and of course I had read those posters that they'd make a man out of you, and uh, then uh, I knew that I'd get away from 
all the restrictions that I had been under from home and everything else. And, uh, of course, the police had, had taken a protective attitude toward me ever since that first arrest. They watched closely after my welfare. And, <clears throat> and in the service, you do have the freedom that you want. Because I learned early in the service that old adage that they can't make you do a damn thing, but they make you sorry as hell that you did. But this thing began to happen to me in the service that it nearly killed me. Now, every time I got drunk, I didn't get in trouble. But when I would get drunk and get into really bad, I learned early in the service that if you ingratiate yourself with the higher ranks, it helps. They called it brown nosing. <laughs> and I became an expert at it. So when I would get into this bad trouble, I'd call on one of them and I'd get out of it. And lo and behold, I'd get promoted. Well, I went in as a private. I got promoted after some trouble to sergeant. After some more trouble, I got promoted to first sergeant. I watched the officers and worked in the officers' club, and I decided I wanted that, so I applied for a commission. And after a big drunk, they called me and said, you're going to officers' candidate school. I went to officers' candidate school, which was the strictest thing we had during World War II. I didn't get into any trouble whatsoever that I didn't get caught until the last night at the platoon party in Abilene, Texas, at the hotel. I missed the tra truck going back to the base. I ran down the street. The MPs grabbed me, and we had a little conflagration, and they drug me back to the base, and I got called in the next morning at 5 o'clock, and I knew this was it. I was on the way. And... Uh, captain said, sit down, and that was strange, because when they were going to chew you out, they want you to leave that part exposed, you know. <laughs> and it turned out he was a lawyer from up east, and he hated MPs, and all he asked me was, how'd you do in the fight? <laughs> and I got my commission, and then they asked me where I wanted to go, and I had heard that of course, I had got a, a commission as a medical administrative officer. I'd been in the medics prior to this, and that was the easiest thing for me to do. In addition to that, the medics had green alcohol in 55-gallon drums. <laughs> and then I heard that in the Air Corps, we didn't have an Air Force then, it was the Army Air Corps, that they had whiskey. And the medical department handled the whiskey. And the medical administrative officer was in charge of it. And it was expendable. So I asked for the Air Corps, and I got it. And uh, as an officer, they couldn't give you the punishments they'd done as an enlisted man, like KP and latrine duty and guard duty and all that stuff, but they could transfer you. Well, I got sent down to Florida, and I didn't get transferred for a little over a week. <laughs> and then they sent me to another base in Florida, and we couldn't live on the base, non-flying officers, so we had to find quarters in town, and... Uh, this uh, colonel, I mean major, who was my immediate superior, he was a doctor, he and I lived in this Hillsborough Hotel for about a month, and then we came in and they requested that we leave there. And so I had met some people in, uh, that lived in Tampa, and they told me that I could come and live with them until I found an uh, adequate place to live. And I came in, I lived with them for five months. And they began to have parties every night. And I thought, hell, these, nobody can live this way. And I was delighted, but it was strange because they were family people, you know, and everything. And they'd invite all kinds of people over and everything. Finally, I discovered that the reason they were having the parties and inviting all these people over, they wanted them to watch me drink. I never felt so great in my life. I had a great capacity and a great tolerance for beverage alcohol. I had it up until almost, well, to the end of my drinking. I could drink for large quantities, and I could last a long time, and it got to be one hell of a burden, I'll assure you, particularly financially toward the end. But finally, uh, they did send us over to win the war. We went over, we went in the 8th Air Force, and we went over to a little backward country called England. And I got transferred around a few times over there, 
for various and sundry little impecunities which generally happened in the officers' club. Finally, I got into one difficulty with the chief of staff's girlfriend. He accused me of being improper in my attitude toward her, and I was just as nice to her as you could be, you know, but... <laughs> They gave me uh, an opportunity to volunteer for a secret mission or else. They put a bunch of us on the ship. It was 1,300 of us. No, none of us knew where we were going. But during the course of the journey, I discovered that every one of those 1,300 had been permitted to volunteer for this secret mission under similar circumstances to mine, so you know what kind of a damn crew we had. We wound around through the Mediterranean, landed in North Africa, went through all through the Middle East on trucks, and we got up into uh, Iran, up to Tabriz, and they put us on some trains with the curtains drawn, and we went into the dining car and poured us a glass of water, and it was vodka, and we knew where we were going. We got into Russia, and the day we got into Russia, 1,300 people began to try to figure out a way to get out of Russia. Now, these people, some of them came from Iceland. Some of them came from some pretty horrible places to have to serve. And, but they wanted to get out of Russia so badly they'd go anywhere. It was the worst that any of us had ever seen. And we'd come through some pretty rough times at the beginning of World War II, some pretty rough bases and circumstances. But let me show you. In just a few months, the Russians invited me to leave. I got into some difficulty in the officers' club <laughs> with some Russian officers. So they sent me as a punishment back to England. But they told me to report to a general, a major general. He was a doctor, head of the medical services and the whole European deal for the Air, Air Force. I went into his office and he said, sit down. Oh, I forgot to tell you, in, in Florida there, um, this doctor and I, we were on the base and we were restricted because they were sending a contingent overseas and they always restricted the base. And he and I decided we better go into town because we had something important to do. And so we drove down through the gate and the MPs fired at us and hit him right in his posterior. And so I knew that this was going to get me some bad time or something. So anyhow, I got called into the colonel's office the next morning, and he said, sit down, and he said, Chair, said, you've got to quit running around with Roundtree. He's a bad influence, and I got promoted to first lieutenant. <laughs> and now I get back from Russia, and I go into this general's office, and it turns out that he'd been a doctor in the U.S. Army in World War I and been loaned to the white Russians during the Revolution, and he hated communists, and I got promoted to captain. <laughs> now, the reason I'm going through all this crap is... I'm 23 years old. Now, you tell me, and I had drunk myself from private to captain in about three and a half, four years. Now, tell me how you could convince me that there was anything in the world wrong with drinking, that I shouldn't drink, if anybody would have mentioned it, and several of them did. Anyhow, uh, along about this time, my resistance was pretty low. After that Russian tour, I was weak and defenseless almost. <laughs> and I picked up the only souvenir that I brought back from World War II. <laughs> and that was Old Violet. <laughs> but nobody brought back any more durable souvenir than that. Because <laughs> that was 44 years ago, and I'll guarantee you she's just as tough and rugged today as she was then. I didn't know it, though. I thought she was a lady of some decorum when I married her, but I learned better over the next 15 years. The war ended, and I thought, hell, I, I've been over here long enough, and i got enough of these points of what you had that surely I'll get to go back home, because everybody by that time wanted to go home. Because we I was having a ball. I don't know why I wanted to go home, but I did. And anyhow, they called me in and said, you're going to Berlin. 
said, uh, you're going to be in this occupation deal, U.S. Group Control Council, and we need your services over there. And I didn't know what in the hell. I thought they had plenty of drinkers, but anyhow, <clears throat> I went over there, and uh, I made a deal where I could fly a courier plane, black, uh, fly on a courier plane back to London every weekend. And one weekend, uh, the weather was a little bad, and I decided I didn't want to fly on that plane going back to Berlin, so I didn't. And 30 days later, the MPs came and assisted me to get back to Berlin. And uh, as a punishment, they decided to send me back home. And I came back to New York, Kilmer, Camp Kilmer, New York, and they called me in. <clears throat> said, we're getting ready to form the United States Air Force. And we're getting a cadre together to go down to Fort Sam Houston. And if you'll go into this cadre, we'll promote you to major. We think that God doesn't enter our life until we begin to get into this program. God enters our life way back. And He gives us nudges and kicks in the tuckers and uh, pushes a long time. And He gave me one then because I turned it down. I would have wound up in Fort Leavenworth Penitentiary or somewhere if I had stayed in the service. But it wasn't my brilliance. I just figured that, hell, I'd be a returning hero in Nashville and I'd be a lot better off there, uh, whatever. So I went back to Nashville and uh, I didn't get exactly the welcome that I wanted. Of course, I hitchhiked back. I'd spent all my money in New York. And I went back to this place that I'd worked previously, this place where I was an executive. I had been 19 years old when I left, but as far as everybody who had met me in the uh, intervening time, I, I was one real big shot with this printing company. And they said, uh, we got your desk ready. And so I sat there for a couple of months, and I said, well, now I'm ready. And they said, for what? And I said, to start selling. That's what I am, a salesman. They said, hell, we don't need salesmen. They said, we're doing more business than we can handle by mail. I said, well, why would you hire me back? They said, the law required it. And, of course, being uh, the self-respecting person that I was, I was indignant about that. And so I said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, I'll give you two weeks' notice. They said, no, we'll give you two weeks' pay, and you can go back to the Elks Club where you've been staying most of the time anyhow. So I looked around, and I didn't want to waste my great talents, and so I found me a job that suited me. I became a wholesale whiskey salesman. <laughs> at this time, whiskey was at such a premium, all you had to do was call the stores on the phone and tell them you'd let them have so many cases of good whiskey if they'd take so many cases of this damned old wine. Now, wine wasn't in then. It wasn't the thing. So uh, anyhow, this guy had some good whiskey. He had Canadian clubs. And uh, several other good whiskeys. But a year later, he went broke. He had two more salesmen just like me. <laughs> and, we, and we all got a little too full of our business. <laughs> and here I am at liberty again, so i got to find something that's commensurate with my great ability. And uh, somebody has, I think my mother, has suggested real estate. So I went up to one of the companies and I told them I might be interested in uh, letting them enjoy my services. And they said, all right, why don't you ride around with some of our salesmen and see what you like, see if you like it. And so I did. Well, real estate was at a terrible premium then because they hadn't built anything in about five years, you know, and it was short. So uh, all they'd have to do is get something listed for sale and it was just automatically sold. I was riding with one guy one day and he had a couple in the back seat. And he drove by a house, and he said, now, this one is $4,600. Now, these were, this was in 1947. And uh, the man says, well, we'll take it. And the woman said, well, we'd like to look at that house. And the man looked at it, and he said, woman, don't you know there's people living in the house? They said, we'll take it. And that was how easy it was to sell them. And then you waited for about a week to get it closed out, and then every salesman I rode with got drunk. And I knew I was qualified. This, this was where my, my niche and I became a real estate peddler. And as of today, I've never lost that job since then. Of course, a year later, I got my broker's license and went in business for myself. The qualification for a broker's license then was having $5. <clears throat> well, as 
a real estate peddler, the same thing began to happen to me that had happened in the service. I got involved in the Home Builders Association. I did because they had great parties. At least once a month, they had a party, and all of the whiskey that you could drink, and gambling, and occasionally they'd have some dancing girls there. Well, I didn't bother them. I'd watch them occasionally. But uh, <laughs> I got in with these builders, and they began to give me their property for sale. Whole subdivisions. Sometime I, I, at one time, I had four subdivisions exclusive. I mean, pretty fair-sized ones for the times. So, and... Uh, I began to make so damn much money. I made more money than I thought that, that the government had. But strange things began to happen. The bank couldn't handle my money. Because every month they'd send me a letter and say, you're overdrawn. And I couldn't understand it. And then other strange things began to happen. Old Violet began to criticize me. Now here's a lady uh, of broad viewpoint, I thought. European women were generally that way, I thought. Because as soon as she got to the States, the American women began to Americanize her. <laughs> and they began to tell her what she can make me do and what I'm not allowed to do and what she ought to, uh, all of the stuff that you all are familiar with. <laughs> and she began to criticize me just for very simple things like not coming home for a night or two. Sometime for a week or two. She didn't realize, and most people don't, that uh, selling real estate is not just a, a, an automatic thing like signing a contract and, and going and closing out the deal. Hell, you've got to stay with them sometime. <laughs> and she began to do something that really irritated me. She began to profane me. And I felt that a man deserved all the respect that a human could have in his own home. But she would curse me when I came in that back door. And she would be standing waiting for me in the al pose, you know. <laughs> and she'd invariably say the thing that she knew would, would make me the maddest. She'd say, you dirty, rotten, drunken bastard. The word bastard is a nickname amongst alcoholics. You walk into a bar and they say, hello, bastard, and it's all right, but it's with a good accent. But with that English accent and coming out of your wife's mouth, it seemed like it would just drool down. <laughs> and, so, and so I would push. We, I never hit her, but I'd push her a lot, you know. And, but she'd never stay down. She'd come right back up. And then the police, they began, again, just as soon as I got home, they began to protect me once more. <laughs> they would arrest me for public drunk sitting in the back seat of my own car. <laughs> and they'd arrest me for driving too slow. <laughs> Fortunately for the driving public, the drunker I got, the slower I drove. <laughs> and I asked the police one time, I said, I didn't know there was a law about driving too slow. They said, no, but there's a law against parking in the street. <laughs> and then we had other misunderstandings. One night I took a client home about three or four o'clock in the morning, and after I let her out, I couldn't find my billfold, and I went back to see if perhaps I had misplaced it in her pocket, and so... <clears throat> I knocked on the door and the window and the walls, and nobody came, and I kicked the front door in, and it was the wrong house. And <laughs> I got arrested for breaking and entering, and I had no intention whatsoever of entering that house. <laughs> and then after we adopted our little boy, he was playing out with another little kid, and they got into an argument. I went out to straighten it out, and his daddy came out to straighten it out. And I began to straighten his daddy out, and his, da his daddy went home and went in the house and called the police. And I went up and knocked on his door and maybe kicked it a time or two. And they arrested me for attempting to commit a felony. My lawyer explained, I learned a lot of law during my drinking days, and 
My lawyer uh, explained to me that it's a felony to go on another person's property with malice or forethought, and I said I didn't have any malice. I was just going to hit him. Uh, <laughs> numerous things like that happened. Uh, I'm kind of like, I think it's Tom O'Sullivan says that I went to jail so damn much that I'd walk in and say, any mail? <laughs> I knew all the desk sergeants and turnkeys by first name and they me. Life began to take on a little different tone. I began to experience the loneliness of drinking. I came home in 1958. I had own office, and I had uh, several couches in the office that opened out into beds. That was for the convenience of -of out-of-town customers that might have to spend the night. (laughs) And I came home after having spent the night or two in this old office, and I was expecting a warm family greeting, and I got that same one as usual, you dirty, rotten, drunk, and busted, and... Our son was about eight years old at this time, so I pushed old Violet, and she pushed back, and about that time, this little boy ran up, and he said, Don't you hit my mama, you old son of a bitch. And that was the last straw. That was the last disrespect I could tolerate. So I gathered up all my belongings in the, an alcoholic fashion, you know, in both arms, and put them in, packed them in the back seat of the car. And I went over and got me an apartment that belonged to the friend of mine who owned the whiskey store in front of the apartment. And airline hostesses did stay there when they were at the Nashville end, and I thought they are trained to take care of people when they're sick, you know. And I thought also I'd have the freedom that I had wanted. I had always wanted and never had. There's always been some restriction on my life. Somebody always leaning on me. And sure enough, it was great. They were just as jovial and friendly and affable as they could be. Not exactly, but almost. And uh, it was wonderful for about a week. And damn, if they didn't start criticizing just like old Violet. (laughs) They started saying these stupid things of, why do you drink like you do? I said, hell, to get drunk, what else? I never knew any reason to drink other than getting drunk. However, I didn't consider it drunk if I remembered what happened last night. I think somebody else said that. Um, but I've all, all, I started having blackouts when I was about 16 years old. I thought that was drinking. If you remembered last night, you couldn't have been drunk. You might have been high, but that was all. And anyhow, and then they would say, well, uh, we got to go home. Those were the most depressing words that anybody could say to me. I got to go home. And they'd leave me all alone. And I began to get that loneliness again. And I'd watch the old television till it'd go off. And in those days, we just had two channels in Nashville. And they went off about 10.30 after the news. And then I'd listen to the radio and I'd play. I'd call in my requests for these lump songs. I liked to cry when I was drinking by myself, you know. And <laughs> I'd uh, request, there stands the glass. And let me go home, whiskey. And I'd think about that little boy, and I'd request, my little shoes keep walking back to you. (laughs) And wild goose. It's, uh, I want to go where the wild goose goes. I didn't know where he went, but I wanted to go somewhere. (laughs) But the best crying song they ever wrote was Born to Lose. (laughs) But then the old radio would go off, you know. And you really were all alone. And they came out with a song sometime in there. It said, counting flowers on the wall, that ain't no job at all. Playing solitaire with Dawn with a deck of 61. And hell, I identified with that whole thing. Finally, this one morning, about 3 or 4 o'clock, I decided I might give old Violet another chance. (laughs) So I called her in. I, the ones of you that heard her heard that smart-ass remark she came up with. I said, what are you doing, baby? I'm out mowing the yard and heard the phone ring. <laughs> but I let her 
invite me, I finagled her and let her invite me over. And we began this period of reconciliation, and it lasted until my clothes ran out. Now, I had a lot of clothes because a man in my position had to have, he had to keep up a good appearance, of course. And when they brought out a new line like Dean Martin or anything, I bought it all from the socks, the garters, the drawers. Everything that they had, I bought it all. And every time they brought it, and I had so damn many. I looked like a pimp going to a picnic most of the time. <laughs> and, and as they would get dirty, I would take them over to her, you know. And when the last ones got dirty, I took me over. And we sat down and we did have the first thing, first time in our married life, we'd been married about 15 years at that time, the first time we had an honest talk. Not a long one, not of great effect, but uh, we had came up with two solutions or two agreements. One was that she'd keep her big mouth shut and I'd do my drinking at home. The other one was that there would never be any recrimination from either side. She'd never throw up my... I told her, I'm going to tell you, and I did tell her, everything I'd done, most of it she suspected, but she didn't know for sure. I didn't tell her details. I told her in a general way. <laughs> and I told her if she had ever was... If she couldn't forget all this... If she ever going to throw it up to me, there was no use in us trying again because it would never work. I'd seen it happen previously, and my mother and dad had lived a life like that, and I knew I couldn't tolerate it. She agreed, and I'll give her credit. She has never, and I've never thrown up anything to her since then either. But it has made our life comfortable. It, without it, I doubt if we'd have survived that marriage. Uh, <clears throat> now, this other agreement... I agreed that I would drink at home, and I did. And when she found out how much, she got worse than she'd ever been. This was the first time she realized the, the capacity that, that I had and the tolerance that I had for it. How long ago? I would, I would drink copious quantities, and then I'd pass out and stay passed out for a while, 30 minutes, hour, hour and a half, come to, and start all over again. And it was round the clock. And it really scared her. It scared her so that that fear turned into anger, which it generally does. And uh, her anger created anger in me. And our two angers made a hate-love relationship that was just about as intolerable, intolerable as any people can, can stand without doing something violent and drastic, which fortunately we didn't do. I'll tell you one smart thing that I did that God had to be telling me too. I came home from the service. I had about eight or ten guns that I had liberated in various places over in Europe. As soon as I got back to Nashville, I gave every one of them away. So we never had a gun in the house. And I doubt if, the two, if both of us would have survived if we had had a gun. Because our attitude toward each other was anything but peaceful. What had been a horrible life prior to our separation became worse now. And neither of us knew what in the hell to do about it. We went to the priest, and he gave us all of these platitudes and so forth, and the best he could do. And he was as sincere and as he could possibly be, uh, just like in suggesting that suggestion that a baby would solve the drinking problem. Bless their hearts. They, they mean it, but you just have to forgive them. <laughs> but we had no idea what to do. And anyhow, on this morning of... April the 6th, 1960, I, I got up and got into hunting my whiskey. And she's still talking about we played hide the bottle. I'd come in from the old office, and I'd bring me a night supply, and she'd hide it. Well, then I started bringing it in and hiding it, and she'd hunt it. So, <laughs> and she'd invariably find it because we didn't have any. We had a large two-bedroom house. Uh, it was almost as big as my Cadillac. <laughs> One time I found a place to hide it where she couldn't find it for three weeks. It was in her sanitary napkin box.
But I got up to hunting this whiskey, and I walked into the kitchen, and lo and behold, a shock. You know, alcoholics become accustomed to these bad things, having to hunt the whiskey and all this kind of stuff. And when a good thing happens, it can conceivably shock them to death. And this one was a terrible shock. There it sat on the kitchen table, an uncorked fifth of Canadian Club. That nasty note. But I overlooked it, and I figured she might... I thought she might have poisoned it, but the seal wasn't broken, so... uh, (laughs) I took me enough to get started on, you know... Uh, I heard people when I first came into the program get up and talk, and they'd say, and then I took the morning drink. Hell, I didn't know there was any time to drink. I never knew there was. All my life, when I was a kid, I worked at night, and and I drank all night, and uh, I drank all morning. I drank at any time. I figured the time to drink was when you had it. And... So anyhow, I took enough to get me started, and I went down to the old office, and the day had started wrong, and it got worse, because I would drink and pass out, and when I'd come to, I began to have flashbacks of my life. And this is the first time I was nearly 40 years old, and I had never faced myself before, and I didn't do it on purpose this time, I guarantee But they began to flash back like the old serial movies, and I'd pass out, and they'd keep coming back, and pass out, and they'd keep coming back. And... <clears throat> I saw what I had been all the way back as far as my memory would take me. And I saw what I hadn't been, and I saw what I'd done and what I hadn't done. And I saw the most horrible thing in the world was where I sat at the moment because there was nothing in front of it. It was totally void in front of that and black, awfully black. And I felt like I was falling off the world. And I had nobody to turn to because by this time I'd pushed out every human that hadn't voluntarily walked out of my life. And I figured this morning old Violet had done it because I thought she was gone for good. And I began a little bit after all that day to understand why she would. I never had previously. I'd never understood why that woman could criticize me. After all, what look at all I'd given her. My name... My presence, everything about me had belonged to her when I was home. (laughs) But this day I began to understand why, and I I thought she was gone. I thought, and I was afraid to call on God anymore because I had used and misused and abused God, and I saw that this day. See, during the previous ten years I had taken pledges. The first couple of pledges I kept. But I was the most miserable, mean, ornery dude that you have ever seen. I was so bad that I went to the priest for again, and he said, Cherry, I'm not giving you another pledge of total abstinence because you're such a mean son of a bitch when you're sober. His very words. He said, let's try pledges of partial abstinence. So we took a lot of them. These were things that we had done, all of, all of us had done previously. You know, only drink beer, only drink wine, only drink after four o'clock. I got me a clock with all fours on it. Uh, <laughs> and naturally, none of them were any good. And, but I knew I'd been phony. I'd go to confession, and I wouldn't go to the confessional because, hell, they could hear me a block down the street anyhow. So I'd go into the rectory and go into the study, and I'd kneel down, and I'd say, same thing, Father. He'd say, same penance, Cherry. And I saw just how hypocritical I had been in all of my worship of God. And I figured, God is through with me, too. And uh, he's showing it because here I am, absolutely and totally alone in this world. And that was just about as close to despair, to total despair, as... I think a human can come to. I, don't, I know I couldn't have survived another day like that. This had to be the day for me. As it turns out, it was. But anyhow, finally I figured, well, I got the church on a retainer. Because when I had made money, I had always given the church money, you know. And I'd build a room on the rectory. Because I'd always put up a sign done by Jerry Carpenter. <clears throat> but... I figured they had to take my business whether they liked it or not. So I went back and went up to the rectory, knocked on the door and started crying. And the priest opened the door and it wasn't my old drinking buddy priest. It was a new little smart-ass priest that had just been ordained. And I he wouldn't even let me come in. Put his hand up and said, hold it, Cherry. He said, we're not giving you any more pledges. He said, they're not doing you any good. He said, why don't you try Alcoholics Anonymous? 
Well, he couldn't have shot me anymore if he'd said, why don't you go across to the Baptist church? <laughs> Here's my last resort. The people that are responsible for my soul, and they ain't taking my business. <laughs> I read somewhere that uh, inevitable is not hard to accept when there's no alternative. So AA was inevitable for me because I had no alternative. I had to say, all right, Father. I said, will you call her? Now, he was new in the parish, but he knew her because she had been there so damn much. She had cried on the priest's shoulder till his sleeve drunk, shrunk up to his elbow. <laughs> and I started home, and on the way, I envisioned what I had waiting for me. Now, at that time, old Violet had honed down to about 90 pounds. Well, you look at her now, and you can tell how skinny that she was. Well, her clothes were still back up at 120 or 30 or whatever it was. So everything hung on her like a moo-moo. And her hair was like Medusa, you know. She wasn't, she wasn't very neat in her appearance. And her face was so hatchet sharp that her teeth hung out like fangs. Her, her face would jump start a tractor. <laughs> I found out later she had an equally flattering image of what was on the way home to her, too. I got to the house and I went into the door expecting that same old deal, you know, the pose and all that stuff. And the final shock of the day, and it's a wonder this one didn't kill me, because she was smiling. And I thought, this old fool has really gone. I said, I knew her roof was leaking, but it's blown off now. I said, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, oh, that's wonderful. And I thought, what does this old fool know? See, here's God again. God, he's sneaky. <laughs> if, I, if she had let me know that she'd been in contact with this devious outfit called al -Anon, I would have never gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. I would have died before I would go. So for once, he made her keep her mouth shut. I don't know, some of you might not be familiar with al -Anon, and I don't know if they still practice and preach the same principles that they did then. But then they had told her, quit hiding this whiskey, don't pour it out. If you hadn't got enough, manage to get him some more and get him down as quick as you can. And when he gets there, leave him. Don't cover him, don't put a pillow under him, just step over him and go on about your business. And if people call and ask for him, don't lie, don't say he's sick, say the son of a bitch is drunk. <laughs> That's a hell of a way to treat sick people. <laughs> but that's called detachment with love. <laughs> they call it that. <laughs> The next day, I went to the old office, and I weaned myself. I just drank about half as much as usual, you know, because I knew that I had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no choice in this world. Finally, after old Violet calling about 20 times during the day, I, I managed to dial the number, and this voice answered. I said, is this Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, yep. I said, uh, have you got a meeting up there tonight? And he said, yep. I said, well, can I come to it? He said, have you been drinking? I said, I've had a couple. He said, well, come on up and we'll look you over. I thought, hell, I ain't even going to get in there. <laughs> I went up there finally, it was about 6.30, I guess. And it was at 47 and a half Union Street. Well, my old office had been down at 2nd and Union, and the Elks Club was up at 6th and Union. And I had stumbled, staggered, and puked up Union Street many a day at noon 
all during the day. But this night I stood across the street and watched carefully that there was nobody around before I went in that door with AA above it. (laughs) And in those days, AA was either in a basement or way upstairs. You didn't have any ground level AA anywhere. Not in our area, anyhow. So I started up these steps, and he told me he was on the third floor, and I counted the damn steps, and there was 52 of them. And at the top, they had a sign all the way across the wall that said, only 12 more steps to go. And I thought, hell, it's exercise that keeps them sober. <laughs> and I dreaded this voice that had come on the phone, you know. But I walked in, and this little dude ran up to me with his hand out and just scared the hell out of me because... People hadn't done that for many years, you know. Not on purpose. He said, we've been waiting for you. And I thought, that damn old woman. She won't even let me do this by myself. So I went in and we started talking and I started telling several gathered around. We didn't have any great amount. I think it was about 40 or 45 AA members in, a- in Nashville at that time. But they gathered around, uh, they didn't get much new meat, so when they did, they pounced on it, you know. <laughs> and I started telling them how, what a rotten, lousy bum I was and all that stuff, and then they began to finish my little anecdotes for me. Then they began to tell stories that paralleled mine completely, and I knew old Violet had called and told them about me. <laughs> We talked for a while, and they had all these platitudes around the wall, you know, first things first, and easy does it, and let go and let God. And I thought, God, this is a simple bunch of crap, isn't it? <laughs> then they said, let's go into the meeting. And I didn't know what we'd had for the last hour standing there, but I know this one little dude during that time. He'd listen to me a while, and finally he'd look down at me. He was about a six, eight inches shorter than I am, but he always looked down at me. And he said, he said, if you're an alcoholic, and we don't doubt that you are, he said, you've got three ways to go. You can get locked up, covered up, or sobered up. And I hated his damn guts. Because I knew there had to be some other way. I didn't go up there to quit drinking. I didn't go up there for a new way of life or morality or any of that crap. I went up there to quit hurting because I had such a pain in me that I'd do anything, even subject myself to uh, something this low. Because I'd heard about AA and a lot of two, from a lot of two-meeting graduates in the saloons, you know. But we went into this meeting, and this first guy that got up, he told his name, and I immediately recognized him. He was the editorial cartoonist of the National Banner. And he told about having been given this ability to draw these cartoons. He answered one of these little uh, matchbook things, Can You Draw?, and he had got this course in cartooning, and he had become a cartoonist for the biggest newspaper in the southeast, the uh, Memphis Courier Journal, or Memphis, whatever it is. It was the biggest one in the southeast. And he had drunk it up and thrown it away. And he'd wound up, or not wound up, but he had got out into West Texas somewhere. He didn't even know how he got there or anything else. And uh, he was swamping out saloons for drinking money. And somewhere or other, he had got to AA. And he came back to Nashville. And he went to the other newspaper in Nashville, the Nashville Tennessean, and they gave him a job. And they paid him each night. He got the job one day at a time. And he got sober one day at a time. And he's now 13 years sober. And this is impossible. Nobody could do that. But he's 13 years sober, and he's the editorial cartoonist for the other newspaper. And that's the first ray of hope that I had had in a long time. Because my philosophy had always been, why live to be 100 when you crowd it all into 40? And I was 40. And I didn't think that I was able, I didn't think there was anything left in life for me. But this was hope. The next guy that got up was this little smart ass that had told me there was only three ways to go out there. And he talked about the dives and the saloons and the places in Nashville that I had read about. 
<laughs> but he always ended his talk, he said, if it'll work for me, it'll work for a dog, and he looked dead in my eyeballs. <laughs> and after the meeting, and incidentally, he became my sponsor. <coughs> After the meeting, now I had absented myself from home for varying periods from one day to three weeks without notice. <laughs> this night, I wanted to stay up there a while, so I decided I'd call old Violet and tell her I'd be a little late. Now, if you think God doesn't start working early, so I went over to the end of the bar where the telephone was, and I reached for it, and I nudged this matronly looking red haired lady. She too looked down at me. She said, What do you want, you scramble eyed son of a bitch? And I never felt so at home in my life. <laughs> you hooked me. The first damn night I came to this program, you grabbed me and I couldn't get away. There was just no way for me to get away from you from that moment on. Not that I ever really wanted to, because I questioned it a lot in the next few months. I wondered, I sat in many meetings and wondered, what in the hell am I doing here? I'm above all this, you know, after I got over the last drunk. I shook out every drunk that I ever had. I never had any medical attention. <clears throat> and incidentally, that, that night, I asked them what I have to do. And they said, don't take a drink for one day and come back to the meeting. I said, you got a meeting tomorrow night? They said, no, but don't you worry about it. I didn't know what in the hell they meant, but I found out. On the way home, I said, God, these people got something and it's working for them. I don't think it'll work for me, but please give me the guts to have a shot at it. And I was dreading that night because I knew what was coming. I knew what I was going to do. I knew the shaking and the puking and the blowing. I don't know what alcoholics get out of blowing, but if they can harness the energy that alcoholics do when they're shaking off a drunk, they get up and they go... <laughs> <laughs> they could get rid of all the nuclear deal. <laughs> I knew what was coming. No sleep. Maybe 15 minutes, then jump bolt upright and think it's got to be morning already, you know. But you know, I guess I must have got three or four hours sleep. And it wasn't half as bad as it had ever been before. And I had been on a two-year two drunk this time. I hadn't sobered up for two years prior to this. So I know. You know, we talk about, somebody mentioned, I, I think Mary or somebody mentioned the, the miracle, and we, we know all about the miracle of recovery. But the great miracle in our life is survival. That's why I can't, I can't understand how anybody can doubt that there's God in their life. God, Buddha, Allah, whatever name you want to put to Him. He don't give a damn what you call Him. <laughs> Hell, He's always there, and uh, you've spit on Him, you've kicked Him, you've done everything, and He's always been there, so what the hell difference does it make what you call Him? But how you can doubt that when we know I had 47 wrecks from the end of World War II till I came to AA. I never got hurt in a wreck, and I never hurt another human being. I got shot at. I got cut with knives. I spent a lot of time with not the most desirable people in the world, because I got kicked out of the nicer places early in the evening, and by morning I was always in the lowest places there was in town. And I'm sure a lot of people identify with that. And I never got I, I, I survived all that. And I know that these people didn't do it. My family didn't do it, and I certainly didn't do it, so God had to be there to do it. Our survival is the greatest miracle in our life, and the rest of the miracles follow later. But how we can ever doubt God? Old Violet told her about that second meeting. That day, Rosier, he was a character. He was a lawyer from up in East Tennessee, and he, this was the second talk, or the second night, and the first full talk that I heard. Old Dave had got his uh, law degree and license right in the beginning of the Depression. And he couldn't make it as a lawyer. So finally, 
through politics, he got him a job with the State Department in Washington, and he found out then what Washington was. He said it was the refuge for the incompetent. <laughs> in the State Department, all you had to do was show up to keep the job, and he lost it. <laughs> and he went back to East Tennessee, and his brother, who was fairly affluent, set him up in the law practice. And he drank it up. And he wound up in some dive joint somewhere, and his brother came and got him and set him up again, and he lost it. Well, he was in this bank building in Maryville, Tennessee, and he had drunk up all his furniture. He had drunk up everything, and the owners of the bank, the bank itself, had uh, requested many times that he move his office somewhere else. But like all most alcoholics, he was loyal, so he stayed right there with them. And he wound up there with no furniture, no place to live except his office, and he had an old library table in his office. That was all. And one night, he's laying on that old library table. He reaches in the drawer, and there's a piece of AA literature. And he came to AA, and when I heard him, he was 13 years sober. 47 must have been a hell of a year for recovery, but he was 13 years sober. And not only was he back in his practice and still in the same build our office in that bank building. He was a director of the bank. And that gave me some more hope. And I had to have it. I had to hear exactly what I heard. But every bit of it convinced me more and more that this was it. This was the solution. This was life. And these were the people that I needed to be with, whatever life I had left. And we began to enjoy the benefits of, of sobriety. And my, I, this sponsor, he was exactly the kind of sponsor I, I needed. He was very gentle. He said, Terry said, you're going to have a problem with this program. And I said, why is that, W.A.? He said, because it's a simple program and you're a smart aleck son of a bitch. <laughs> and he was right. We went through the first four chapters in, in the big book. We went through it like a, a schoolwork. He said, it's a textbook, and we're going to study it, and we did. We went through that dude, and he was a book man, let me assure you, and he allowed me to be, because every time I'd go to him with a problem, he'd say, it's in the book. And I'd say, where, W.A.? I thought at least he'd tell me what chapter. He said, find it. <laughs> and I read that book many times before he died in 1965, but I never failed to find it. We went through the first four chapters, and then we got to chapter five, and he says, now, this is what you've been asking all the time, how it works. You want to know? Every time I'd say, well, W.A., how's this thing work? And he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, uh, the, we, we've got something we're going to lay on you when you're ready for it. And I thought he was going to hit me with some foo-foo dust or something, you know. And <laughs> he said, now we're going to go into what you want to know. He said, Here's, it's entitled, How It Works. I don't want to ever hear you say, I'm working the program. I'm working the steps. It says, it works. You use it, and it works. And it works better if you do use it. We went through those uh, several little paragraphs before the steps. And he said, now here's where you qualify as to whether you're going to want this program. And it says very simply in there, it uh, emphasizes honesty several times in there. And he said, I know you don't know what this honesty means. It means self-honesty. He said, I know you cheated solitaire, and I knew old Violet had to tell him that. And he said, I'm going to tell you what self how, how you can practice self-honesty. He said, there's a, re a traffic light down at the corner uh, when you leave this meeting room. He said, if that traffic light is red and there's not a soul on the street walking or driving, so you stand there until it turns green. And when you can do that three times in succession, you will begin to understand what self-honesty means. I thought, oh, hell, it's a snap. It took me three months before I did it twice in succession. <laughs> then, and it also says uh, that some people are constitutionally incapable of being honest, and they can't make this room. But it says there's other people who have grave emotional and mental disorders... And they can make it if they're honest. What it says is, if you're a liar, hang it up. But if you're crazy, you've got a shot. <laughs> there was another old guy in there when I came. 
named Charlie, and I'd walk in there every night. And I'd say, how you doing, Charlie? He said, just right. And I finally heard that so damn much, I couldn't stand it. I said, Charlie, nobody can be just right all the damn time. He said, the hell you say? He said, all you got to do is what the book tells you to do. He said, if upon awakening you turn your day and your life and everything about you up to God, over to God, and you put in your effort, then the results of your effort are always going to be just right because God doesn't make mistakes. So whatever's happening is just right from that day till this. If you ask me how I am, how I'm doing, or whatever's happening, it's just right. And that shocks the hell out of people. This doctor that's doing with me, he said, uh, I walk in his office, he said, how you doing? I said, just right. And his eyes bug out, you know. <laughs> they don't understand. And there's no need to explain to them. They're not going to understand. They haven't been where we've been. Well, you've got to be there before you can enjoy it. You've got to be hungry before you can enjoy food. Anyhow, we got on through those first several little paragraphs and we got to these steps and he said, now these are simple. He said, I don't want to ever hear you complicate them. I will tell you how simple they are. He said, the first step says you're drunk and crazy. That's all it is. You're a drunk and you're crazy. And if you don't believe it, go to the second step and it says, here you're going to hunt for this God that has uh, saved your life already, this omnipotent omniscient, all-loving power who will even make you uncrazy. And then the third step that people have so much trouble with, I have a problem with that third step. I hate to hear people say that. All you're doing is doing God the great service, saying, God, will you make me uncrazy? And then the fourth step, he says, yeah, I will, damn right. What do you want me to do? And you write him down what you want him to do. You say, here's what we got, God. Here's the good and here's the bad. All the good that I could find was that I didn't want to be what I was, but at least that was something. And then you check it over with somebody who's been around the pot several times to be sure you haven't minimized or exaggerated, which we're slightly prone to do. <laughs> and then you get down to the another decision. Do I really want to get rid of all this crap that I have just enumerated for God? I hear people say, I've heard lots of people say, I don't want to get rid of all my defects of character because I like some of them. That's like saying to the doctor, if he tells you you've got a cancer here and a cancer down here, say, God, take out this cancer down here, but leave this one because I like to cough. And after you're really ready to have all these done things removed, this is another. See, you're never trapped in this program. You don't ever get boxed unless you do it yourself. Then you, you've made this decision to get rid of all of them. You want them. Then you just, with all the honesty, humility is just as total self-honesty as you can have. And uh, you say, God, you know me. I know me. Will you please help me get rid of these things? And then you go back to the list that you made before and then you add whatever you need to it to, to find out all the people that you've hurt and of course we exaggerate that too hell I said man it's going to take a whole book for me to write down all the people I'd hurt my sponsor says hell you had not harmed all these people I said that's your damn ego talking I said you've annoyed them you've aggravated them you've irritated them but you haven't harmed them he said go in and look at the people you've really harmed and then after you've made that to your own satisfaction, as good as you can, they, you don't have to worry about being perfect. It tells us in there we're not expected to be perfect. We're just expected to shoot our best stick. Then you make direct amends. It don't say apologies. No way in there does it say go and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hell, that's uh, sort of redundant anyhow because everybody knows how damn sorry we are. Uh, <clears throat> It says, make amends. If you killed his cow, go take him a bottle of milk. But uh, just <laughs> do something. Of course, the best amend that we can make to our family is a change of attitude. That is the most terrific gift we can offer to our family. We can quit being that rotten, nasty, arrogant, overbearing, mean, stinking son of a bitch that we were and just try to be a halfway decent human being. That is uh, a direct, as direct a man as we can make. Well, now, if you've done this, you're right with God and with yourself. 
and with your fellow man. And if you want to stay that way, all you got to do is keep it. Clean house. Maintain it. And the next three steps enable us to do that. We just continue to look for the trash. First, this inventory, the tenth step says continue to take inventory and back to the same thing. You've got to take your debit and your credit. And we all have got some credit side. And the greatest credit side is what God's done for us. So we start that inventory every day for me. Writing a little written gratitude list to God. And then it says, and when we were wrong. So we ain't wrong all the time. Just the wrongs. You pick that out and you say, God, I'm, I'm aware of that. You help me and we'll get rid of that dude too. And now God has got to be your best friend because you've got the greatest life in the world after you've come this far in the program. So you want to be closer to Him like you would any best friend. You want to visit with Him and talk to Him and share with Him. And meditation just means thinking on all of these great things that you've listed in your tenth step. You just think on them. You, you give Him all of the credit for everything good that's happened. Don't see gratitude is giving God credit and ego is taking credit to yourself. So keep the ego out of it and say, thank you, God. And please show me the direction to go and give me the strength to do it. And that's exactly what it means in that step. It don't mean, God, you do it for me because God's already told us that He'll only do what we can't do. And this is what we can do. We can take this path that God shows us and we can follow it with His help. And then it tells us what, it, what we've got out of the program. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Not a result, but the result. It doesn't say having got sober, having got wealthy, having got my wife back. A lot of people would quit the program if they did that. It <laughs> said, having had a spiritual awakening. You know, that was originally experience. When I came in, it was still experience. And it scared the hell out of a bunch of alcoholics. They'd stand around and say, you had your spiritual experience yet? I said, no, but I sure did dread it. <clears throat> but spiritual awakening, and what all that means is total freedom. I'm, freedom from any, I'm free from any outside influence. Nothing outside me can control me. It's all with me and God in here. This thing inside me that kept me from going on down, kept me from being a, a, a total gutter bomb through, fully lost human being has uh, come alive. It's awakened. And this thing inside me is all I have to have. This is it. And it's you, God. And I know that if I use this, I've got the most wonderful, comfortable life that humans can possibly have. Having had this, all I have to do to keep it is to give it away. Pass it on. That's why they entitled that last biography of, of Bill's, Pass It On, because that's all it, that's all it boils down to. They told me in the beginning, it says, if you want to keep it, you've got to give it away. And being the selfish son of a bitch that I am, I have wanted to give it away. And I have tried every way that I know. And I have realized that I don't have the abilities that I had when I was drinking. So I have to confine them to what I really can do. I know now what I am. I know pretty well. I'm finding out every day the most beautiful thing of this program is the ability to learn about ourselves. And it never ceases. I was sober about three years and I went down to Mississippi to visit Bish Mathis. And I extolled the virtues of sobriety and everything that was great about this program to him for several hours. He'd been sober about 16, 17 years at that time. And we got ready to leave, and he put his arm around old Violet and me, and he says, you think this is great life, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, you think it's a wonderful program, don't you? And I said, I sure do. He said, well, I want to tell you something. Well, I thought there had to be a gimmick in this program right from the beginning because it's free, there's no rules and all that stuff. Nobody wants anything from you. And I thought there had to be a gimmick, and I thought to myself when he said that, now I'm going to find a gimmick. I'm 500 miles away from home. I'll get drunk. I'll never get back. All those things went right through my head, you know. I said, what's that, Bish? He said, it only gets better. It was such a relief that I really didn't hear what he was I, I heard it, but it didn't register what he was saying there. I've never forgotten it a day since then. Every day that I use it, it only gets better. Every day that I let it, it only gets better. And then it says, try to practice these principles in all your affairs. Now, that was the hardest part of the program for me. I could do it real well. 
in AA, in my business even. I could do it with, in social functions. I could do it anywhere until I got home. When I got home, it stayed right out in the car. <laughs> I went back in with that same attitude for quite a long time. Finally, one day, one guy told me I had a trouble with anger. Anger, of course, was that fear. Fear that I wouldn't measure up. Fear that things wouldn't happen my way. Fear of, I'm scared. And that created this damned anger. And uh, finally, this guy, also been sober a long time, he told me, he said, Cheris, I see you're having trouble with anger, and I did too. He said, but I finally realized one day when I let somebody or something make me angry, I'm letting them make me hurt myself. And I decided I'm not letting any son of a bitch make me hurt myself again. And that registered, and I began to think about it, and I began to substitute humor for anger. And now our life is just one comfortable, humorous life. It's serious as far as our program is concerned, but not as far as we're concerned. Not as far as we personally are concerned. Anything that comes up now has a humorous side to it. I mean, this problem I've got, this physical problem I've got, hell, it's got a great side. You know, they said you'd grow in the program, and I did. Sixty-five pounds I grew. Well, because I can't eat now, I've lost 30 of it. So, it ain't too bad. But uh, I can't think of a life without AA anymore. If I knew I could drink, if I knew I could never have any problem drinking, if I knew I could do everything I wanted to drinking, I wouldn't want to drink because I'd have to leave this fellowship. I'd have to leave you people. I wouldn't be a part of this anymore. I would, I would soon forget how to live. So I wouldn't even think about it. The, the, there's no way in the world would I trade anything for this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's given us everything. It's given us... Because I'm an alcoholic, my son was exposed to the program so that when he got into trouble, he knew exactly what to do. He didn't come to us. He went to other people in the program. And he got sober. And this boy who hated us, this boy who despised us, probably with just cause, because we were controllers, he is now my very best friend. He works for us. We're closer than 99 years to 100. Because he's an alcoholic, this little gal that he married, this little gal that we despised and who despised us bitterly with just cause, she got into the program and she got sober. And now we have a loving daughter-in-law. She's got room for growth, but she's still doing better. Because I'm an alcoholic, and my son's an alcoholic, my daughter-in-law's an alcoholic, our grandson, who has every inclination of becoming an alcoholic, when he hits his bottom, he'll know exactly where to go, because he goes to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings regularly. He goes with us on Friday nights, and when he's old enough, he'll be in our team. And because of that, all I hope now is that you're still here, you still have your arms open, and welcome him when he needs it, because... We look forward to the time when he does. Oh, I thought somebody had written me a note. <laughs> I, in a few minutes, we'll take a break, and uh, then we'll come back and we'll finish. <laughs> I'll tell you how I end my day, and, and then I'll let you go, because I know that old adage that, Man can only absorb what the posterior can endure. So, <laughs> I end my day with a little uh, a prayer. I ask God to help me lose resentment, hate, envy, jealousy, fear, self pity, false pride, procrastination, anger, lust, greed, criticism, gossip, dishonesty, sloth, ego, selfishness, and whatever else I've encountered in the day. <clears throat> And I ask Him to help me have love, tolerance, patience, understanding, honesty, integrity, industry, compassion, charity, humility, faith, and gratitude, and whatever else I think I'm going to need for the next day. By that time, I'm so damn tired, I go to sleep, and I've given Him something to work on all night. Thank you. (laughs) 